kick started this morning. We've been in a series uh, taking steps of faith out on the water, uh, all based uh, kind of on the idea of what, what happened to Peter there in uh, Matthew 14. And we started there where, where their disciples had gone out into the sea, and there's a storm, and the waves are huge, and, and they're scared, and they don't know what to do. And, and Jesus comes to them walking on the water, and, and Peter says, if that's you, Jesus, command me to come to you. And, I mean, what a crazy, <laughs> what a crazy thing to say. And Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out of the boat. He takes this, this crazy, audacious step of faith towards Jesus. One that completely didn't make sense. And sometimes that's our faith walk. It's just these big leaps of faith just that Jesus leads us into and we, we don't know what's going to happen, and we're, we're, we're not sure if it's safe. But we know Jesus is there, and so we just step out of the boat. And then last week, David was sharing from um, kind of all over, but we talked from 1 Peter 4, verse 10, where, where we're all gifted to serve in, in unique ways. And so as we look at how God has gifted us, would we step out in faith and serve in the gifting that God has given us and not use that for our own fame and our own glory, but use that for the kingdom of God to build up his body and see the transformation of our city. And I, I wonder as we, as we think about that, like, how many of us are sitting there? I know last week, like, I've, I've been stirring in that a lot. Are you using the gifting God has given you to serve the kingdom in the best way that he has uniquely made you to do? Have you stepped out in faith in those ways? Because for some of us, it might be pretty scary. It might actually take us, we could feel comfortable in what we're riding in right now. We, it's safe. But God has gifted you in such a way that you're not serving in it, though. And it's going to take a step of faith to get there. As we continue on today, we're going to talk about spiritual disciplines. And, and when I first thought about this, I was like, man, what does stepping out in faith and spiritual disciplines have to do with each other? Like, I, I really struggled with this concept and was wrestling with, with how are the two tied together. But, but in week one... I was speaking out at Riff, and David was speaking here, and as one of uh, my good friends pointed out, both of us said that we were going to give some practical ways to step out in faith, and neither one of us really did. <laughs> That's today. <laughs> um, and, and Jesus has, in, in the Word, he's laid out all kinds of ways that we can step out in faith very practically every day walking with him. And so we're going to dig into that some today, and as we do it, we're going to begin in Luke chapter 18. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, but before we get there, um, I want to tell you um, a, just a little bit of a, a story of, of, of growing up. So growing up, I grew up in kind of a, a very traditional church, and so for me, spiritual disciplines were always like, well, just read your Bible. Just read it. You know, it wasn't so much like, read it to get more of Jesus, but just read it, just pray, just give, just serve. These were things we did. Just do it. Just do it. No matter what, just do it. And the problem as I grew up and as I, I, as I began to read the Bible, I felt like I was reading other things where, where Jesus was saying, if you come to give and you realize you have sin in your heart towards your brother, don't give right now, but go and get the sin out of your heart towards your brother and ask him for forgiveness and make things right and then come and give the gift. It wasn't a just do it mentality, but the heart mattered a lot. When we think about spiritual disciplines, when we read through the scripture, there was this, this religious group. They were called the Pharisees, and they were great at being good. When it came to being disciplined, fasting, prayer, giving, memorizing scripture, gathering together, man, they were the best. 
They take our collective disciplines, like one of them, and just put us to shame. Yet when Jesus speaks of them, it is not with kind words, brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. He says, your hearts are far from me. See, they had all the disciplines, but their heart, their heart was far from God. When I think about discipline, like for me, this is, it's, it's hard because I am not naturally a, a disciplined person. I have a lot of otter in me. I like to play. I like to have fun. And so when I think about disciplines, I think about work. And so then when I think about work, and when I think about my relationship with Jesus, well, I'm like, I don't want my relationship with Jesus to be work. And so I, I've long struggled with this concept. And as we were preparing, I was thinking about my love for running. And this is all going to tie together, I promise. A lot of you know when I was in Arizona, I, I, I got depressed and I gained a bunch of weight. In fact, there's a picture of that um, that, that I put in there. And um, there I am. And um, this is uh, December 2008, and uh, I'm probably 255, 260, 265. I was a little scared to step on a scale, to be honest. Um, somewhere right in that range. And um, you can take that down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in January of 2013, as, as I began to spiritually reconnect with the Lord, um, the Lord began to speak to me that I, I needed to physically begin to take care of myself, that I, that I had not stewarded my body well. And then as, as I was beginning to slightly go on that journey, it became clear that the Lord was showing us that he wanted me to go to Bible college. And, and in high school, I ran cross country. By that picture, you would have never known, but I had a dream in high school of running at the collegiate level. Now, I was never the best. I was number five on our high school team, four or five, somewhere in there, and I was just that steady guy, but, but I always wanted to run at the collegiate level, and, and so the school we were going to, they kind of had a, a, a budding cross-country program, and I was like, what if, what if I could run again? And this was a crazy, crazy dream, because you just saw that picture. That guy doesn't run on a college cross-country team. But I began to, to think, what if it could happen? What, what if Jesus would allow for this? And so I, I began to discipline in my eating habits and in my exercise. And, and it was hard at times. But as I pursued after this thing that I loved, it made it worth it. See, it made the sacrifices worth it the disciplines, because my heart was all in going after this thing that I loved. I think that's what Jesus is looking for from us. Read with me in Luke 8, 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, Thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray our hearts would be humble before you. Lord, may you stir in us a deep heart and passion for your things and your dreams. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
from this passage, I think you could see in what we've talked about so far that the idea for today is Jesus wants your heart. When you serve, when you study the word, when you memorize scripture, when you pray, when you give, Jesus wants your heart. It's not about just getting it done, but it's going after this person that you love and realizing how much he loves you and resting in that. When I pursued my wife, as I began to court her, I never felt like I had to buy her flowers, that I had to write her a handwritten note, that I had to give her a kiss. Those were all things I wanted to do, because I was pursuing this person that I loved. Today, as we talk about stepping out in faith and our disciplines, we've got to take a shift of heart. It's not about you have to read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible tomorrow, Jesus doesn't love you any less than he loves you today. Oh, but he wants your heart, church. He wants relationship with you. He's pursuing after you and he's asking you, come pursue after me. We see this play out in a, a ton of different ways in Scripture. And I just picked a couple, just kind of as the Lord, as I studied and the Lord brought to mind things that, that I've struggled with over the years in discipline. Where Jesus said, I don't want you to just do it, but I want you to bring your heart before me in this. And I want you to pursue relationship. I want you to pursue me. Because see, this morning, if church was about a checklist, if it was about getting in with God, if it was about just doing what you were supposed to do, then you should actually walk out the door right now. I invite you to. But if it's about getting together with Jesus, if it's about meeting him corporately together, if it's about bringing your heart and laying it at the altar and saying, Jesus, I can't do it. I need you. I mean, then you're in the right place. Because I believe that is the heartbeat of what we want here in New City. We don't want a bunch of religious trappings and actions that lead to death. Oh, but a relationship that breaks free you free from sin and addiction and death and fear. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about stepping out in faith in our disciplines with walking with the Lord. Not a do it list. But a relationship where the God of the universe, the one who shaped everything, is pursuing hard after you, saying, I love you. Come rest in my love. And he has a dream for your life, church. He has a dream for our church. He has a dream for our city beyond anything that you've ever thought to dream or imagine. Some of us are pretty good dreamers. I'm one of those people. Sometimes I make David laugh. <laughs> and we can just, we can paint this picture in our minds of what Jesus can do. But even then, Jesus has so much more. 
I think about that dream I was pursuing back in Arizona and how hard I worked towards it because it was something that I loved. And I'm deeply stirred about my lack of pursuit of the dreams of the kingdom that I have for this church and for Oshkosh. And I have to ask myself, where is my heart? Is it pushing towards Jesus or is it just doing it? See, when my heart was all in a dream, I did everything I could to make it happen. knowing ultimately that, that Jesus had to provide. Jesus had to do some things. And I called out and I prayed like it all depended on God, but I also worked like it depended on me, putting in my everything. We're going to look at a couple scriptures real quick and just kind of a few case studies in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew 6, Jesus in what, is in what we call the Beatitudes. And in Matthew 6, 1, he, he talks about us giving. And he says in 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others, other people, in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound, me, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. How can we step out in faith in our spiritual disciplines? Man, we can be disciplined in our giving, but, but not, just, not just doing it. But see, Jesus wants your heart in your giving, church. It's clear here. He says, don't do it for the applause of men. Don't do it for the sake of doing it. Don't do it because it needs to be done. But do it because, because you want to be with me. You want relationship with me. As Jesus continues on in his teaching, in Matthew 6, 5 through 7, he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. See, Jesus doesn't say, don't pray. He, says, don't. he doesn't say not to not come to him. But he says, when you come to me, come to me with your heart. Sometimes, man, it breaks my heart when people are like, well, I just don't have the words. I don't know what to say. Jesus doesn't care what you say. He wants your heart. Some people, I've heard them say, I just don't know that my gift is worth anything. It's not very much. I, I barely make any money. I'm a part-time college student. Why should I bother to give? Why should I help the needy? It's not how much you give. It's the gift. It's your heart. It's saying, Jesus, here's my gift. Multiply it. And he doesn't stop there. And this one's, this one's going to wreck and challenge a lot of us. It has many times in my life. In, in Matthew 6, 16 through 18, Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus says in, in verses 16 through 18, and when you fast, Jesus didn't say if you fast, but he says when you fast. Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that the fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, 
that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is what's amazing about what we're, we're hearing here. Jesus says, I want your heart. I want you to come after me. I want you to pursue me in these things. And I'm going to reward you for it. Church, when I think about fasting, it is a lost discipline, a lost, a lost way to love our Lord in our culture, to sacrifice, to shut off from something. Now, the most typical way to fast in the biblical times was to remove yourself from food. And in our culture, there are, and there are many different fasts that I've seen, from television to, to Facebook to, to phone all together to food. And I'll have you know, there are people in our congregation who are fasting and praying over some of your lives specifically and over the dreams of what God could do in and through New City Church. And I would challenge you that Jesus wants your heart. And so to deny yourself, to deny yourself of that thing that you love and use that time to focus in on the one who loves you. Fasting can be done for many reasons, but the number one thing that I've always garnered, always, always garnered from fasting is more of Jesus. And it's amazing because as I get more of Jesus, I see more of the floodgates of heaven open wide. It's not easy. Probably the hardest of any of the disciplines we've talked about today, for me personally, is fasting. As you see, I love food. And so to deny myself and say, Jesus, today is about more of you. Or to deny myself and say, Jesus, today is about calling out on my sister's behalf or my brother in Christ's behalf. And I'm going to deny myself because they need more of you. It is said that early Christians would often fast for two or three days, praying for the needy and then taking what they had saved and giving that money to them. Both being disciplined in their fasting and in their giving, in their heart towards their neighbor and the Lord. See, church, if we do the little things like they are big things, then God will do the big things like they are little things. Let me say that again. Mark Batterson says, if we do the little things like they are big things, then God will do the big things like they are little things. But all too often, we're caught up in one of two things. Just do it. Or our hearts just aren't in it enough to even care to just do it. We find ourselves in this middle place. And I wonder, I wonder what God could do in each of our lives. I wonder what God could do through us corporately as a church if we would step out in faith in our spiritual disciplines and take a step towards Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't know about all of this, but you said you're going to honor it, and I do want more of you. So here's my heart. And sometimes it's going to be hard, but is the dream, the dream of more of Jesus, the more of what he could do in and through you worth 
that discipline, pursuing more of him? The question is, church, what do you love? It might even be the dream. Do you love the dream or the God that gave the dream to you? What are you pursuing? When I was pursuing this dream of running, eventually I came to this head where I had to lay the dream on the altar before the Lord and said, God, if you don't want to see this dream come true and you have a better dream, then I want your dream and not mine. And as I did that, God said, that's, that's what I wanted, Jeremiah. I didn't want this to be your dream. I wanted it to be my dream so that I would get the glory and not you. And I got to live that dream. I got to live that dream of running collegiately in cross country. And it was hard at times. And it took discipline like you wouldn't believe. That's not the same guy that you saw in the beginning. Six months. It was hard work. There was dedication. But in the midst of that, as my heart, you can take that one down too. <laughs> in the midst of pursuing that dream, I began to pursue more of the heart of God. And I realized that God was gifting me and enabling me to do some things that I hadn't even dreamed about the dream. And this is what's so wild about pursuing the heart of God and pursuing the dreams he has for you. Is he begins to open up these doors and begins to give you opportunities that you never saw, that you never dreamed, that you never even thought to go there. And you're like, wow, Jesus. As I think about this dream and what I accomplished personally and physically and, and the work put in and how I pursued with all my heart towards it, I ask myself this question, what, what if I put that much effort, that much heart in pursuing Jesus, what could he do with me? What could he do with our church? if we pursued the dream of a relationship of walking daily with God, day after day. What about that dream? Is I didn't make any exceptions. I knew I had to stay on a very narrow road. And as I walked that road, I saw the dream become a reality. Church, Jesus has a dream for us. Jesus has a dream that we would step out in our faith, in our disciplines, and see more than we ever thought or imagined, to maybe see what we see in Acts, Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, 42, we see this dream come true of what could be, what could be. 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and all had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all that had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord add it to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Every day, people were getting saved. Every day, they were being unified in biblical community. Man, this is my dream for our church. Every day, somebody would be calling up Pastor David, dude, I was sharing my faith today. I was just telling the story of how God saved me. And he saved someone else. And sharing your faith is really that simple. This kind of dream, church, I believe could be our reality. But are we willing to walk in it? Is our heart in it? Because that's what Jesus wants. So we have a lot of talent in our church. We have a good amount of resources. But man, if our heart, with that talent and that resource, I'm just like, what if we all began to walk here? What if I began to walk here? What could Jesus do? do with that.